If you don't like the fact that the vote on approval or disapproval of President Bush's plan to send 20,000 new soldiers to Iraq didn't make it to the Senate floor because of a threatened filibuster, blame Aaron Burr. If you don't like that at almost any time, just one single member of the Senate can hold up an entire branch of American government, you can blame Aaron Burr. Yes, Aaron Burr, that troublesome man who was Thomas Jefferson's vice president, almost stole the presidency from him, who shot Alexander Hamilton and almost started a revolution out west. Could it be that he caused any more trouble in American history? Perhaps. Of course, it isn't like Aaron Burr created the filibuster, nor did he ever engage in a filibuster that we know of. If someone had said the word filibuster... He would not have known what they were talking about, perhaps vaguely suggesting that someone had mispronounced the Spanish pejorative for a sea pirate or freebooter, a filibustero, on which the word takes its meaning. The term filibuster wasn't used in the sense of American government until 1851. The filibuster was created when Aaron Burr made a mistake or an oversight. Actually, he was trying to be helpful. He suggested to the Senate, during a revision of their rules, that they clean them up and avoid redundancies. Parliamentary procedure has a motion to move the previous question, which is always confusing to those who use Robert Rules because what it really means is not to move the question you had been previously talking about, but to move the question you're talking about now. In other words, let's stop debating and let's go to a vote. And it's a motion that requires a member of the body to raise their hand, make the motion, have it seconded by someone else, and then have a majority vote. It was not needed, Burr suggested, in 1806, because it had only been used once in the history of the Senate up until that point. The motion was removed from Senate rules along with a few other changes, and once that happened, it became theoretically possible for a senator to grab the Senate floor and never stop talking. But it's hard to blame Aaron Burr truly for the filibuster since the first use of this obscure rule was not until 31 years after he made the change. In 1834, the Senate had formally censured President Andrew Jackson because he withdrew federal deposits from the Bank of the United States, something that he didn't want, didn't want a national bank. So he used his executive authority to withdraw the deposits from the bank. The Senate censured him for that. The censure kind of came back into the public discussion during the Clinton impeachment affair as it kind of was thrown out there as a way of avoiding impeachment. It doesn't have any real force. It's just kind of a mark on the record. But Jackson's supporters were unrelenting in their efforts to erase the censure. Between 1835 and 1837, six state legislatures, remember these are the people voting for senators at this time, replaced their senators with men who promised to remove the mark against Andrew Jackson, who was through most of his time a popular president. And so three years after the censure, in 1837 now, a group of Jacksonian senators moved to expunge the censure from the Senate Journal. That would in effect indicate that the censure never happen. Opponents to the expungement started to simply talk and talk on the Senate floor. It didn't take long for Jacksonian senators to realize what they were doing. It was evident, said Senator Thomas Benton of Missouri, that consumption of time, delay, and adjournment was their plan. Jackson supporters responded quickly. They prepared for a long night fortifying themselves with ample supply ready in a nearby committee room of cold hams, turkeys, beef, pickles, wines, and cups of hot coffee. They had a party, and their supplies would go a long way to see that that first filibuster was short-lived. Near midnight, the opposition gave away. The Senate passed the expunging resolution, 2419, and the anti-Jackson senators stormed out of the Senate, before the expunging could be completed. In 1841, Whig Senator Henry Clay, who previous to this had been Speaker of the House, now was a senator, reported a fiscal bank bill to the Senate designed to establish the National Bank 
that Andrew Jackson had always opposed. When Senator John Calhoun, leading the Democrats, made it clear that the minority would not be rushed, Clay called for a revival of the previous question motion that Aaron Burr had discarded to allow a majority to control the business of the Senate. When Senator William King of Alabama, who was opposed to a Bank of the United States, asked if Clay planned on introducing such a measure, a gag measure as he called it, Clay said, I will, sir, I will. King then made his clear his intention to filibuster such a proposal. I tell the senator then, King said to Clay, that he may make his arrangements at his boarding house for the winter. At the insistence of his own Whig party, which feared that a gag measure would lead to a breakdown in relations and would stop the business of the Senate, Clay stood down. He agreed to compromise. The filibuster showed its most powerful effect. It would become a maneuver so powerful that it need not be used at all. And the practice of filibustering would grow in the last half of the 19th century. And four times, senators unsuccessfully attempted to reform the procedure. In 1850, in 1873, and 1883, by moving to add the previous question motion to the Senate rules that Burr had discarded. And in 1890, they attempted to create cloture precedent through a majority vote which means a majority of of senators could vote and the person would have to stop speaking. These attempts were all unsuccessful, partially because any time it would be attempted, a senator would filibuster. 111 years passed from the elimination of the motion to move the previous question by Burr until anything was done about the filibuster, and it took the Germans to help the process along. In 1917, America intercepted the Zimmerman note now, this is during World War I. Europe is involved in war, but America is not yet. A communication from the German Foreign Ministry to the German ambassador to Mexico was intercepted. The ministry, the German ministry, advised the ambassador that Germany was about to begin submarine warfare unrestricted in the North Atlantic and that these actions might provoke a change in American neutrality towards the war belligerents. The Zimmerman note further advised that the ambassador, in the event that America did side with the Allies, was to explore with the Mexican government the possibility of an alliance with Mexico against the United States. In exchange, now this is the good part, Germany would assist Mexico to reconquer the lost territory in New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. You can imagine the outrage, especially in the western part of the United States. February 1st, 1917, President Wilson countered with the Armed Ship Bill, a proposal to arm American merchant ships so that they could defend themselves in the event of a German attack. Wilson hoped that this defensive measure could enable America to protect itself without entering the war. The House passes the bill overwhelmingly, and there was great support in the Senate, but a group of 11 isolationists led by Senator Robert La Follette of Wisconsin, well-known progressive senator, filibustered. Although under the bill, America remained neutral in the war, these senators feared that this legislation would mark the first step towards American engagement. La Follette and his allies would not permit the bill to come to a vote. The filibuster had gone too far. Public reaction was immediate and condemning. Even when Wilson declared that he would, under the authority granted by existing statutes, arm America's merchant ships anyway without Senate authorization, The public was still outraged at the Senate. Across the nation, rolls of dishonor were inscribed with the 11 senators' names. In Oregon, a group of voters attempted a recall of Senator Harry Lane, who was filibustering. At the University of Illinois, students hanged Senator La Follette in effigy. President Wilson well reflected the public mood when he said that the Senate of the United States is the only legislative body in the world which cannot act when its majority is ready for action. A little group of willful men, Wilson said, representing no opinion but their own, have rendered the great government of the United States helpless and contemptible. The remedy, Wilson said, there is but one remedy. The rules of the Senate should be altered so that it could act. Wilson orders a special session of the Senate. That session starts by ruling that it must first establish the Senate rules, that it's a new body, it's a new Senate, sort of a change in philosophy in previous senates, they must first establish their 
rules before proceeding. And so the rule changes cannot be filibustered because the rules haven't been established yet. That Senate in 1917 votes to add a cloture motion. And that's with one minor change that we'll get into a little later, the only motion that's available today to end a filibuster. And it required two-thirds of the Senate to basically stop a member from talking. And that was fine in 1917 because only 11 senators were blocking the armed ship bill. But it was not the end of the filibuster. In 1946, Southern Democrats blocked a vote on a bill proposed by Dennis Chavez of New Mexico that would have created a permanent Fair Employment Practices Committee to prevent discrimination in the workplace. And this is in 1946, well ahead of its time. A filibuster began and lasted weeks, and Senator Chavez was forced to remove the bill from consideration after a failed closure motion, even though all along he had enough votes to pass the Fair Employment Practices Committee. Strom Thurmond set a record in 1957 by filibustering the Civil Rights Act of that year for 24 hours and 18 minutes, although the bill ultimately passed. Thurman broke the previous record of 22 hours and 26 minutes set by Wayne Morse of Oregon. Thurman had visited a steam room before his filibuster in order to dehydrate himself. Thurman had also brought a quantity of malted milk tablets and throat lozenges from his office. About 9 p.m. on August 28, 1957, Senator Thurman rose before the Senate and announced, Mr. President, I rise to speak against the so-called voting rights bill. H.R. 6127, began by reading each state's election statutes. He later read and discussed an opinion by Chief Justice Taft. He also read and discussed the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and Washington's Farewell Address. Remember now, you had to keep the subject of your talk germane to the topic. Can't read the phone book as it's often thought of. His wife had packed a steak sandwich lunch for him, and she stayed in the family gallery throughout the night. But after the 24 hours and 18 minutes, his staff, concerned for his health, was successful in getting him to leave the floor. On June 10, 1964, Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia finished his address begun on the previous day slightly more than 14 hours earlier, so not as long as Strom Thurmond. He was filibustering against the Civil Rights Act of 1964, an act which was debated by Byrd and others for 57 working days, including six Saturdays. Senate President Hubert Humphrey from Minnesota needed 67 votes, more than two-thirds of the Senate at this time, to be able to carry the motion for cloture to end the filibustering of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Minority leader Senator Everett Dirksen from Illinois procured the Republican votes necessary to pass the cloture motion. And by the way, uh, it's useful here to point out how much Republicans, working with liberal Democrats, joined together to defeat Southern Democrats and get the votes for the Civil Rights Bill. The role of Republicans in passing the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 gets forgotten, perhaps partially because the Republican nominee of 1964, Goldwater, would reject civil rights. But Dirksen really got the votes that Humphrey and President Johnson needed to pass the bill. More importantly, the filibusters led by Southern Democrats inspired the Democratic-controlled Senate of 1975 to revise the cloture rule so that three-fifths of the senators sworn in, which normally is 60 senators, can limit debate and end a filibuster. That's the rule that remains today. Now, in current practice with C-SPAN and the TV, you don't often see a senator getting up and talking on and on. In current practice, Senate Rule 22 permits procedural filibusters. This is to sort of avoid the contentious floor speech and the waste of time. The way the Senate operates now, if a senator threatens to filibuster, he informs the majority leader. If there's not 40 votes there, the legislation doesn't move forward. A Senate majority leader still has the option of requiring the senator to go through the process of a filibuster, but it doesn't often happen because that would hold up legislation in the Senate. There's one group of bills that cannot be filibustered, and that is budget bills. They're governed under special rules called reconciliation. Reconciliation once only applied to bills 
that would reduce the budget deficit. But there's all sorts of legislation that you can put into a reconciliation bill. You know, a famous example of this is COBRA, which, if you read out the initials, is the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. But you know it as the thing that says your employer has to offer you you your health plan if you leave. Seeking to avoid a a filibuster on his health care plan, President Clinton attempted to put health care through a reconciliation bill, but it was met with stiff opposition from Robert Byrd of West Virginia, who is a stickler for Senate rules. He's known as a great parliamentarian of the Senate. Under the administration of President George W. Bush, Congress has used reconciliation to enact three major tax cuts, and Senate Republicans have repeatedly tried, unsuccessfully, to use reconciliation to open the Arctic National Wildlife to oil drilling. In 2005, a group of Republican senators led by Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist responding to the Democrats' threat to filibuster some judicial nominees, President George Bush, to prevent a vote on the nominations, floated the idea of eliminating filibusters on judicial nominees by declaring current Senate rules allowing such filibusters unconstitutional. Senator Trent Lott, the senior Republican senator from Mississippi, named the plan the nuclear option. The language reflects how powerful the filibuster is in American government. Fourteen senators, seven Democrats and seven Republicans, led by John McCain, Republican, Ben Nelson, a Democrat, brokered a deal to allow three of Bush's nominees a vote on the Senate floor while leaving two others subject to a filibuster. The seven Democrats promised not to filibuster Bush's nominees except under extraordinary circumstances, while seven Republicans promised to oppose the nuclear option unless they thought a nominee was being filibustered that wasn't under extraordinary circumstances. Since no one defined what extraordinary circumstances really was, this agreement amounted to a, we will not kill the filibuster as long as you don't use it. And it may be the end of the filibuster, at least in the blocking of judges. But it sets a precedent to eliminate the filibuster any time it gets annoying. In the end of the day, the powerful threat of the filibuster may be matched by the threat of ending it. We may want to consider if that would be so terrible for American government. The filibuster is an undemocratic, extra-constitutional maneuver that yet has somehow figured pretty well into the mechanisms of American government tends to make American government slow-moving. It functions on a break in an already slow process of government, an extra balance on a system that's got sufficient balance. While it could be argued that the filibuster is a check on majority government, a check against the tyranny of the majority and protection of the minority, its history is certainly suspect, especially its role in blocking civil rights legislation long after a majority of Americans were willing to move forward on civil rights. The Founding Fathers created two checks to protect minorities from the majority. The Supreme Court and the presidential veto seem sufficient in this regard. One could also add a free press and the Bill of Rights. I agree with Woodrow Wilson, who saw so much power in the hands of a little group of willful men. The filibuster makes the Senate too powerful in relation to the House, which is the more local body and the more responsive arm being elected every two years. We must not forget that the Senate is not proportionately elected, so that a senator can be elected with a quarter of a million votes in some states and 20 million in another. Forty senators are enough to block an issue from being discussed, yet those 40 senators don't necessarily get voted in by 40% of the population. It could be as low as 20 or 15 When you earn a seat in a legislature, you have a vote and that's it. If you are in the minority and cannot persuade others, you voted and you lost. That's democracy. The historical use of the filibuster in blocking civil rights legislation where the public was ready for it and recently blocking the debate on the Iraq war when the public in the last election insisted on it, it's clear that the filibuster moves the Senate away from public opinion. But its most damaging effect may be that it hurts the image of the legislative branch. And I also believe by slowing the legislative branch, it gives more power to the executive. When the legislature can't move because of a Senate filibuster, people tend to, sen- tend to say, only the president can act. This body of politicians cannot. And they're willing to accept 
a more aggressive executive. The filibuster should be eliminated, or at the very least, if we don't want to have a government of merely 51%, the cloture motion could be could be changed so that, say, 53, 54, 55 senators could end a filibuster. And there's historical precedent for such change. In a previous podcast, we talked about how that in the 1800s, there was a quorum maneuver in the House where members of a minority in the House would pretend to be absent when the Speaker called for them. Even if they were looking the Speaker right in the face, they would simply not answer. And they did this so there wouldn't be a quorum, so the House couldn't operate, and they blocked legislation they didn't like. Before the turn of a century, a gutsy Speaker simply ruled them present and won the subsequent sniping about the rule change. Had that maneuver survived, the ability to not be present in the House chamber and block legislation, it's unlikely any legislation would get passed by the House. In my mind, the filibuster is just such an anachronism. Hasn't been dealt with yet, but it should be. With History Beating Up Politics, I'm Bruce Carlson.